Hello, hello. Is it weird to enjoy going to funerals? Before March 2020, I loved funerals. It was like a family reunion. Everyone was hugging and loving on each other, taking pictures, and just having a really great time. Today, Jim will do a quick start on how to take advantage of a funeral in a way that will make genealogists proud. And this will be our first, maybe only, Yo Mama episode for Genealogy Quick Start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I'm Shamel Jordan, your host. And today we have two great quick starts, of course. And the first one is Dead Man Do Tell Tales, Bringing a Funeral to Life. Jim will do that alone, solo. Michael's traveling. And our very special guest, very, very special guest, Dina will do. It's your mama's DNA, the mighty mitochondrial. So we're going to be talking about DNA this afternoon. So, and we'll tell you a little bit how we know Dina, if you guys didn't get a chance to see the video yet. So let me bring on, without further ado, my extra special regular guest, Jim Beidler. How are you, Jim? I am well, and yourself, Shamel? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, very nice to see you. We are missing Michael. Um, Michael has, um, he's traveling. Um, so that's okay. Jim, can you handle it? Can you handle me without Michael? And I handle you. I handled you. I handled you without Michael for twenty years. <laughs> so I, it sounds like you're up for the task. So you guys out there, you know what to do. I only see three comments in there, and I know there are a lot more of you guys here. So please announce where you are, and if you are a proud member of a genealogy group or society, please share your group. You might have some genealogy souls out here. So make sure you put that in there as well. So Jim, we're talking about funerals today. What is like the craziest thing that's ever happened at a funeral that you learned at a funeral? Yeah, well, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't enhance genealogy for me. But uh, when my dad died in 1996, uh, you know, I was, Helping my mom out through through everything, uh, as the the only only child, only son, and uh, you know was in the receiving line at the viewing, and um, I I noticed uh, pretty pretty soon at the beginning of the uh, the viewing that uh, some guy greeted my mom and then just made a beeline out the door. And but you know, and there was the next person, and so I didn't I didn't think to to ask anything until we were were kind of sitting back and and reflecting uh, after the viewing was over, and and um, uh, my mom says, "Oh, did you see the guy who was here for the wrong Richard Bidler? <laughs> apparently, apparently, this man had only read maybe may hadn't read any of the." obituary just read the, the name read when the services were going to be and uh, knew a richard Bidler, but not my dad because he 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 uh he says that he says to, the tip off was he says to my mom you know hi i'm i'm surprised his brother clark isn't here and mom, and, and mom says well he doesn't have a brother clark so, so of course that that man's name is to, is immortalized forever in the sign-in book. So, so, so when when uh, future generations, if they come back to that piece of memorabilia, they're going to be like, "What's the what's the deal with this guy?" So, You're going to have them searching for decades to figure out right, what the right, yeah. is. long lost cousin. What, what's his face? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, I thought that only happened in movies. I watched this show called Rake and he showed up. He went to his wrong dad's funeral. Like, how did he not know it wasn't his dad's funeral? Because he was drinking too much. But yeah, 
So let's see who we have here. You guys piped up. Yeah. Look, Paula Moen. Paula has has claimed the number one spot for quite a few weeks here. Uh oh, Dina has brought out Delaware. We have Erwin Poke here. Hello, Erwin. Hey, Wayne and Grace Ann, always near the top. Nice to see you guys. Hi, Denise Payne from the Netherlands. Good evening for you. Yes, I bet it's a beautiful evening there. Hello, Sarah in Texas. And of course, we have Quintilla from Cleveland, Ohio, the AAG. Yes, a great, great genealogy group. Hi, Wanda Looney from Birmingham. I miss Alabama so much, Wanda. I have to get to Alabama. You know, I haven't had heat like that in quite some time. Um, hello, M. Marshall from L.A. Nice to see you. Hello, um, Mrs. Hammonds from Compton, California. We have Kags on here today. Nice to see you. Uh-oh, they're keeping it up. Now we have Sheila Benedict. We have the East Coast, the West Coast is taking over. They and have they have awakened for the day, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> they have awakened. Hi, Sin. Oh, another California, Cucamonga. I've always wanted to say Rancho Cucamonga. That's pretty cool. Hello, Cousin Floyd. Cousin Floyd made it. Cousin Floyd has set an alarm and stopped, by, and stopped blaming me when he missed our show live. So thank you, Cousin Floyd, for getting here. We have Tom Bruce from Amarillo, Texas. So Texas is like, look, we're here too. Thank you guys so much for being here. So Jim, are you ready for... Oh, and I, I would love for... Hey, Lori, I caught you, Lori, from Michigan. And Carolyn Fair from Chicago. Okay, now we can officially get started. Chicago is here. Um, hi, Jeannie from San Fran. Um, so I was going to ask you guys the funniest things you could put in the comments, your funniest funeral tales, like little yeah. short snippets, and we'll read those at the end. All right. You ready, Jim? As ready as I'm going to be. Echoing or something. Sorry, guys, if that's oh. happening. Um our quick start is Dead Men Do Tell Tales, Bringing a Funeral to Life. So step one is create a display for the deceased. So what does this mean? I thought this was the funniest thing in the world. Yeah. Well, and, you know, this, this is to, you know, help center people, uh, you know, who, you know, may only very casually uh, know the deceased compared to, you know, presumably this is somebody who's pretty close to the deceased, uh, a spouse or a, uh, a child. You mean somebody from Facebook can't just show up to the funeral and create a display? They, they, they can, and they probably will. Uh, <laughs> although they're probably more apt to create a find a grave page. Mm, on the don't fly. do that. Don't yeah. do that. People, yeah. if you don't know people, do not yeah. be on your find a grave putting stuff up there if you don't know people. Hello, A people. Say don't do that. All right. Amen and blessed be. Yeah. So yeah, but and and a lot of remember that a lot of people uh may have known the deceased at one time in their life, but they don't have an idea of the totality of the life. Yeah. So breaking out the photo albums. Uh, and, you know, some different memorabilia, things like that are going to be ways to, uh, you know, tokens kind of of helping uh, people learn more about the whole person, you know, person that they may have known in childhood, but then uh, fell away from uh, later on. Okay. I love that. Create a display. And a funeral home kind of does that now with pictures, right? They, they of, yeah. Like, Photo yeah. display, but you're saying kind of maybe do it a little bit more like some memorabilia of them. Yeah, 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 definitely items and uh, you know diplomas or other uh, things from their their life. You know, really, really break things out. And and as we were as we were prepping for this, where it's it's not even a bad idea to like kind of create a kit in advance, kind of a checklist of of things that would be good. I I know. And we're, we're going to show some of the, the things from uh, my mother's uh, funeral. Uh, one of the things I treasure in my memories of my mother is how open she always was about what her desires were going to be. 
okay. uh, whether it was was lists of pallbearers, whether whether it was the song she wanted sung at her. Oh, my funeral. mom said no slow music or she's going to sit up. She said no slow music. If we sing, what's that song they always sing? His eyes is on the spare. If, I, if they sing, she said she's going to actually get up if somebody sings that song at her funeral. So, yeah, you're right. That's a good idea. Mom, sing yeah. what you want. Yeah. And and then and then along with along with putting that together, then uh, also have these other things. It's also not a bad uh, idea to pre-write the obituary, yeah. uh, which uh, I'll admit I did not do. I left that I left that for the for my journalistic skills uh, right after mom passed. And fortunately, it was I had it. I had it all in my head. I just had to had to get it, uh, get it out on paper. Yeah. Yeah. So step two, you're saying after you create that splay is, OK, now we're at the funeral and you want to keep your eyes and ears open. So are we spying on people like what's going on here? Well, we're 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 um, creating some oral history here, recording some oral history here. Uh, you know, the stories that people tell that you, you may uh, may not have known. Oh, uh, I, I know, I know one about my dad that I never found out uh, about for, for sure is apparently he had a nickname when he was young uh, of Webby or Webster and, and his, and his darn cousins, they, they, well, when we did a, when we did actually a book for um, that, my mom and dad on their 40th anniversary, uh, we had asked everybody to fill out a little bit of mini questionnaire, and one of it's what was the funniest story, you know, about about uh, well about both of them, about Mildred, about Richard, and his guy who was kind of his best best cousin friend when he, when he was growing up. His wife writes in, "Luke can't tell that story." <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean you can't tell that story? This is this is now going to be lost to history. So. I love that. I, I love that. We didn't show your mommy. Your mommy is yeah. super cute. She is yeah. super cute. She was. And, and uh, you know, when I wrote the, the obituary, one of the things uh, that uh, I, I really enjoyed putting in, she had served just about every church office at her, <laughs> her church. And, and one capacity was she was the, the president of the church board when what had been a union church of two congregations split up and and uh, in our history uh, one of our ancestors had been uh, on the church board when that union was created um. and here she was doing the sign off when it was it was dissolved and the and the joke the joke was that uh, the we, we were a reformed or united church of christ congregation and it was with, with a Lutheran congregation that the union was. And originally the Lutherans paid $20 to buy half equity in this house in 1836. Okay. In this, in this <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, when they, when they began, when they began the, um, uh, the negotiations for the breakup, mom very graciously said she'd be glad to give their $20 back. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, in 160 years, it ended up being considerably more than that. But, <laughs> but, but I liked writing that into the obituary, showing you know part of her genealogy. Yeah. I love that. She just has that face that when you see mom, think mom. That's the mom face right she, there. She was a quintessential mom. Yes. So I was I was not trying to listen, but I could hear people talking about me at my father's funeral. Is hmm. that is that his daughter? Is that Shamel? Because I wasn't, you know, around my dad. So yeah, this is a good. And then I heard him talking about my brother, about his, uh, my sister who I hadn't met. So I was like, oh, where's she at? So <laughs> I found her and I got a chance to hug her. So um, yeah, keep your eyes and ears open. For sure. All right. Step three is to generate and capture memory. So what does this generate mean? Like, what's that? Yeah, well, here, here, uh, what, what we're talking about is, is reaching out to the people, you know, not just at the funeral then, but for follow up. 
Uh, you know, let's not lose touch again. Uh, you know, and may and maybe maybe even this becomes the jumping off point for a reunion. Uh, that uh, you know that you know maybe there there was a family reunion at one time. Many of those fall away, and maybe this is the time. Hey, let's uh, let's celebrate uh, some other time. In the case of my mother, uh, you know she she died in 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 bitter January, bitter Pennsylvania January cold. And so I waited then to her to her birthday weekend, uh, what what would have been her 84th birthday, uh, mm-hmm. and invited everybody to my place for a cookout. Uh, and her favorite thing was a California burger. Oh, uh, <laughs> and and so we made sure we had all the all the the fixings for her there. And uh, yes, I sent out a save the date card uh, for for her memory. And uh, we we filled we we filled we filled my uh, two acres of uh, of grass with uh, lawn chairs and people socializing and and getting together. So tell me about this burger. <laughs> this well, uh, the the big thing the big thing with my mom when I was a kid, I was what they called sneaky, very finicky. As okay. Well. <laughs> so I would I would I would eat an absolutely. Uh, uh, naked hamburger with just just the burger and the bun. Okay. Well, my mom, on the other hand, she would create this California burger, and and she and my dad gardened quite a bit, so she would have fresh tomatoes. Mm. You know, she would, yeah, she would build some lettuce. Uh, so it would be all the condiments, and I would, I would, I would, I would kind of razz her and how how much this was was building up into a Dagwood burger. Dagwood Bumstead, that's what yeah, I would say. Yeah, which, which she'd be able to fit it into her mouth, yeah. That is so funny. Yes, I love Dagwood. Don't get me started on Blondie. All right, so one thing that we like to do is just say, hey, you tell us about, you know, the tipping in or something like that, just to kind of get people to start. That's like, you know, generating, I thought. Yeah, that. yeah, that's that's right, to, to uh, give them some starters. Give yes, them some right. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and what about recording? Why not? Yeah, why not? I mean, more more funeral homes now, you know, especially with COVID, you know, where people couldn't attend in person. Now, many of them are, I think, are making a recording. Well, I'm sure it's not standard. I'm sure it's an extra, an extra fee. <laughs> uh, but but uh, but you know, just as something that. Uh, uh, you know that captures the moment, captures the people sharing sharing memories. Uh, I know during the during the pandemic, the the first person from my close college circle passed, and uh, wasn't able to attend attend in person, but they live streamed it. Uh, and and you know it was it was so it was nice to see a couple of my college friends talk, but. The absolute best one was a, a, a brother-in-law of, of his who I met, you know, didn't know at all. But, oh, my goodness, he, he captured the essence of my friend because he it, one of the things he said with a smile is uh, this guy, the deceased was, name was also uh, Jim. And he'd say, yeah, Jimbo and I didn't always see eye to eye because because the, the deceased could be he could be pretty stubborn one day. <laughs> Oh, uh, but oh my goodness! But he said we didn't always see eye to eye. But boy, when we were traveling, he could always find the best dirt bag bar with the cheapest <laughs> beer. <laughs> and I'll t- I just I, I I I I was able then to reach out by Facebook to uh, that man's wife, who was the uh, the sister of Jim's uh, Jim's wife, and and I'm like, hey, your husband captured the the essence of uh, of my friend. That's one thing I like about funerals is hearing about the person from other people who aren't yeah. in the family. That's to yeah. me like the best part because you get yeah. to see hear about their life outside of being your cousin or your aunt or your uncle. Right. right. When their right. when their hair was down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to step four, which is to collect and analyze materials from the funeral. So we're like being a genealogist collecting all of the stuff what, what do you mean yeah well and the, you know and this 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 some of this is not necessarily from the funeral but I, maybe we want to call them artifacts 
of death or artifacts of the the deceased. And first and foremost is the uh, uh, the death certificate. You know, you know, I mean, you're going to need those for legal purposes anyway. But squirrel one away for your your uh, your genealogy records. And and I I was the 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 primary informant on my dad's death certificate. And and thank goodness my mom stopped me because I was going to put his the te- his township of birth wrong. Oh, because uh, because of course I I only knew the place where he was he where he lived 20 years but only from age four and that was a different township from where he was actually born uh so so i i could have been a living example of uh of why death re- <laughs> records are the least reliable um but uh, also he ran the genealogical society of pennsylvania he must be right yeah <laughs> doof um but what uh, other yeah. kind of materials might we? Yeah, do? yeah. Well, of course, you, you have the you have the little you the little traditional folder that people who uh, attend in person pick up. Uh, you know that may may have some uh, some information and the sign in book as we have here. Oh, uh, and now this is from my my mother's. I said about that rogue guy who was at my dad's. You know that's the the funny one. <laughs> uh, but but here here we we have. My girlfriend, her son, that co- Luke co- Luke Etchberger, that's his cousin who d- wouldn't tell me the darn story. Uh, <laughs> Susanna and Sandy and I were neighbors and a high school classmate of mine. I mean, you just start going down the list of of everybody who's who's in in the person's life. Uh, and and now that I'm thinking of it on the fly, something I should have done is I should have I should have copied this. And then create an annotated copy. Yeah, you know, that's with, what I was going to ask you. Did you write with, on there with the relationships? You know, this. You know, just just like we're always decrying photos that don't have identifications. Yeah. Well, here it's nice to have the signatures, but you know, what what about how you know how they are related to the person, either by blood or friendship or acquaintance or work or or whatever. Yes, I love that. That's a task that we all need to add to the to our to the end add of our to the list. checklist. Yep. Yes, checklist. yes. Add to yep. get the death certificate and the sign in. <clears throat> yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. So, was there anything else from the funeral that we have um, that you want? I think to it was there? a shot a shot of the little folders uh, that people get, and again, that's based on information that you're that you're going to. Uh, uh, give to the the funeral home, okay. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you still if you still have the things Michael can. Oh yeah, here we here we go. And uh, you know it's uh, you know it's traditional have the the twenty third psalm in there, of course, and and uh, then we have all, all the, the information. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's I think that I think these things are all all correct. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and so Michael, when his display, he likes to put out photo albums. Yeah, yeah, and these are great. And and you know, getting back to identifications, if you oh. have unidentified ones, this may be a time where people yes. are together and can do it. You know, break out some post-it notes or or whatever. Yeah. Uh, do you know who this is? Or or where was this? You know, because yeah. people are ones of vacations to what are now obscure places uh, that uh, that at the time, you know, like Lou Ray Canyon, you, Lou Ray uh, Caves in Virginia, you know, that was right. apparently a big, a big honeymoon spot back in the day. So. Did we ever find out why Michael has this on his display? I, I am assuming <laughs> since he came from a farm family, I am assuming this was, this was something that uh, either was his dad's, or symbolized his dad, symbolizes as, a, his dad. as a farmer. Yeah. 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 Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right. So that's step four to collect and analyze materials from the funeral. And I love that. Get the sign in sheet, copy, and annotate it. Um, step five is to contact family members later for details. So you're saying don't stop the flow of the story to say, right. wait a minute, where did that happen? Which county is that in? Which year did that happen? Do you remember what month that happened? 
So don't keep do that. Going. Keep going. Keep going with everything, and uh, and and you know whether it's for genealogy or what, but uh, oh, you know, keep keep up the connections because uh, you know too too many too many families today. The only times they do get together is funerals, and uh, you know make uh, purposeful times. Uh, my my mom uh, spent about the last five years of her life in a nursing home because uh, she she was legally blind, couldn't walk, uh, but still had her still had her mind was still completely in her mind, and I was able uh, just. I think it was just a year before she died uh, to bring her back out to my house, the house that she had been born in yeah. uh, for, for a cookout with uh, various family members and, and, and people she knew. Uh, and that, that was a great time of, of sharing because uh, it wasn't, it was, everybody was related somehow okay. or by marriage somehow. And I put together, of course, I put together a chart. Uh, and a man who was kind of the, the oldest cousin, uh, okay. he was in his 90s. Uh, he, yeah. um, he remembered that there was a Victrola in the house because he used to come as a, a kid out to the farm, which was what, what, what we were. And so I, I brought that Victrola down from the attic. Oh and, my God. And, and I now have that as a piece of furniture as my, in my living room. Oh my gosh, that's a beautiful story. That's yeah. a beautiful story. Step six is no steps. That was the F, that was the last step. So you're let's trying, go. you're you're trying you're trying to set me up here. Uh -huh. Let's go through the steps for this is a great one, Jim. Dead men do tell tales, bringing a funeral to life. Step one is to create a display for the deceased. You can go beyond that funeral home picture display. Bring some tactical, tactile things. Step two, keep an eye, your eyes and ears open at the funeral. Step three, generate and capture memory. So you don't want to antagonize people. Didn't you and Aunt Susie over there get into a fight? No, you don't want to do that. You want to bring up the cool stuff. Step four, collect and analyze materials from the funeral. And step five, contact family members later for details. Great quick start, Jim. Thank you so much for that. And we will see you on the other side. Okay. Thank you. All right. Did any of you guys have any wild uh, funeral stories? Our funerals are always like, we're sad that people go, but we love being together and taking pictures. So turn your family reunion into, a, I keep calling a family reunion, your funeral into a research spot. All right, let's get ready for our next quick start. Give me one second. Boom, boom. All right. So we are about to have our second quick start with a very, very special guest. And her name is Dina Chasten Ellis. And I'm going to add her now. Hello, Dina. Hi, Shamel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dina, do you know, I think you were actually our first special guest on Technology <laughs> Quick Start. I mean, the first actual show was mm. my cousin, Tori. Yes. And me doing his online genealogy. But he was a part of the crew and he's related to me. So he, he was, he's special. He's special. Okay. Yeah, he's special. He is not. You were our first, so Dina, yay! welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much. All so right, glad Dina. to be here. <laughs> so, um, Dina, we always ask our special guest to tell us their one-minute genealogy origin story, that meaning how you got started and when you knew you were hooked. Whew. Okay, so one minute, how I got started. I'm adopted and I'm a curious person. So I just started to, you know, question everything about where I came from. And um, my aunt got me a DNA test. She actually got me a mitochondrial DNA test. And everyone around me had gotten these results from Africa and they were beautiful and amazing. And I thought I was gonna get a result from Africa saying my oldest female ancestor was from 
some beautiful African country. And my result came back and said, no, your oldest female ancestor was likely European. And um, sorry, that's it. So I knew I was hooked because I'm like, how is this possible? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you came in from the DNA route. So that that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So let's get started with, and I love this title. It's your mama's DNA, mastering the mighty Mito. Yes. So, <laughs> so let's get started with step one, which okay. is to take a DNA test. So Dina, which test are we talking about and where do people take this test? Okay. So usually when we talk about the DNA test, we're thinking of ancestry or family tree or um, my heritage. But in this case, I you can pretty much get a, an empty DNA test. The most recommended one would be family tree DNA. That is strictly mitochondrial DNA. So you want the one that traces DNA passed from the mother to the mother to the mother. I should say passed from the mother down to her daughter and her sons, passed from the daughter down to her daughter and her sons. So from the mothers to the daughters and sons, but only the, the daughters will pass it on. So I'm going to show you provided this really cool graphic. So okay, great. talk to us about this graphic. Okay. So the one on the left says nuclear DNA inherited from all ancestors. That's generally what most of our DNA tests um, are. They test um, the DNA that we inherit, you know, a few generations back. That's the family tree. That's the ancestry. That's the, um, that's most of them. Family tree also offers mitochondrial DNA, which will trace, as you see on the right, um, DNA that came from whoever that person is in black, let's say it's me or you, our mother, her mother, her mother, and so forth and so on. So it's only passed on from the mothers in the family. And this person down here can be a male or a female, both men and women have it. Great but point. Exactly. Okay. okay. Yep. But the okay. only the, the females will pass it on. Mm -hmm. All right. And so you said the first place that's offering that test is family tree DNA right now? That's the one that offers the most comprehensive one. Um, African Ancestry also offers one and yes. they're great. Family Tree offers a very comprehensive one. Okay. So however you get started, I say just get started. Just go. You know, it's also great to take more than one later. So, okay. Yeah. So that's step one is just take a test. Make sure take it's the test. mitochondrial test. Yes. So you have to leave Ancestry, guys. You have to leave Ancestry. <laughs> All right, yeah. step two, after you take the test, what are we doing? We are learning about mitochondrial DNA. So we learned mm -hmm. a little bit. Is there anything else we need to know about mitochondrial DNA? Definitely. I would say two key points. One, um, if you take a very basic mitochondrial DNA test, it'll give you what's called a haplogroup. That is a letter that um, represents the region that your oldest ancestor was from. For example, if your oldest ancestor was from any country in Africa, it'll be an L. If they were from um, any country in Europe, it will likely be an H. So that's just something to know, but um, you'll get assigned a haplogroup. Uh, the further you test your mitochondrial DNA, the more deeply the test will go. So mine went from H to H1, which showed the region in Europe, to H1AF, to H1A, F1A. So it gets from here to right here. And it can really narrow down a lot of info. The other important thing is to remember if you have siblings um, and cousins and you all came from, well, scratch that. If you have siblings and you came from the same mom, meaning you all shared a mm -hmm. mother, if one person takes that um, mitochondrial test, all those siblings that share that mom will take will share that um, haplogroup. So if okay. I had five sisters and brothers, all of us are going to have the haplogroup H. It's different from the other test in ancestry and all that because we all share different Dinkle. nuclear DNA. Yes. But as far as mitochondrial, it's passed down from the mothers to the um, to the daughters and the sons. So you, you don't have to all take a mitochondrial DNA test. Okay. So one of the siblings can take the mitochondrial. As long as they share a mother, yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's let's look at like so. L one is L one like Eve. 
Yeah, it's generally, you know, could be considered mitochondrial Eve. Um, she came from a little bit north into the right, but yeah, it's it's kind of like Eve. That's where everything started. That's a great, great way to say it. And then as Eve branched up and her daughters branched up and all around the world, those con those um haplogroups changed and morphed based on where they were located. Yeah, as an American, this map takes a second because we're so used to America being in the middle of all maps. So it yes. took a second for me to know what I was looking at. I'm sorry yes. about that. No, that's okay. It's beautiful. I love to see that. And that's it's based on the age. L is so old and it, it just goes up and out. So it's wonderful to see it like and that. And you heard about the new, there's a new that new haplogroup that um our other special guest helped to um I think it's L7 or something. Mm -hmm. that, uh, why oh Roberta, Roberta, my buddy. Roberta. Okay. Yeah. DNA yeah. explained. Check out DNA explained blog. I get, I love about, her. <laughs> to learn about that that new haplogroup L seven. Yeah. All right, so we are learning. We've learned about mitochondrial, what it means, and so we're going to move on to step three, which oops, step three, <laughs> which is research the first three female generations. So why mm -hmm. are we doing that? Uh, that's a great question. So I'll give use myself as an example, a teaching example. So I was born in Philadelphia. I was adopted, but I met my biological family. So I was born in Philadelphia. Uh, my birth mother was born in Pennsylvania. Her grandmother was born in Delaware. So, and then her, her great grandmother was also born in Delaware. So just thinking, oh, everyone lived in Philadelphia, you know, because that's where I knew them doesn't mean that's where they were born. Mm -hmm. So it's important to start really digging into just the first few people, the first few mothers and grandmothers that you know. And if you mm -hmm. don't know mom, but you have auntie, if you have mm -hmm. a sister, you know, a grandmother, start asking her about where she was from and where her parents were from. Just a conversation can really make a difference. Um, Ancestry, of course, also offers death certificates, birth certificates. And those places of birth and sometimes places of death are huge. They can they can make you go, what? I thought we were always from Philly. What is going yeah. on with Delaware? So <laughs> that can open up so many doors. And tell us about this. Oh, that. Oh, Chamel. <laughs> this is very special to me. This, I call it my roots and my wings. Um, my biological side is on the left. So you'll see them. Um, you know, you see a woman who looks very much like me. Yes. Um, on the left, then <laughs> this side, yep. <laughs> the eyeballs, side that, everything. The eyeballs, yeah. This, the, the smile. Part, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. On the right, that's my family. Those are my wings. Those are the people that raised me. That's my mom and her mother. And I have a proxy there. The woman above that picture in the black and white. Uh -huh. She's my great, great aunt. She died at 112. <gasps> She's not my, my grandmother's mother, but that's her sister. Her sister. And they share the same mitochondrial DNA. Oh, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, throw that in there because it shows how it's so helpful when you're looking for that, how we have more flexibility. And on the left is my birth mother, her mother, my great grandmother. And then the very top left is little Eliza Jane. She was born 1879. She died 1979. She's my great, great grandmother. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And her grandfather was born 1771. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Did you say 1771? 1771. Her, um, her grandmother was born a little, little later. She was born 1810. And I get all my mitochondrial DNA from that line. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're you're doing research while we're waiting for our tests to come back. And yeah. So when you say you're doing research, it's general documentary research. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It doesn't have to be too in depth. The conversation is also part of research, a quick phone call, maybe to the oldest matriarch. As long as she's on that maternal line, mm -hmm. you know, that would be great, whether it's great grandmom's sister or, you know, your your aunt, whomever. Um, and then, of course, get into ancestry, get into um, courthouses and archives if you have the time, if you have that flexibility and start looking at records. OK, mm -hmm. so let's move on to step four, which is then to research the history of the area. 
So talk to us about that and talk to us about your, you specifically, which okay. area you were researching. Okay. Um, well, like I was saying, in that picture of all the women that were stacked up on the left side, um, they came from a, an area called Sussex County, Delaware. So if you look at the third picture up from mine, that was my biological grandmother. She was born in Delaware um, in uh, an area called, it's Sussex County, but it's, you know, names change. So I'll just stick with the county for now. Um, further up, her mother was born right around the same area. And her mother was born to an emancipated woman named Mary. So in eight, actually she wasn't emancipated. She was a free colored woman. So okay. in 1840, the woman at the very top, her mother was born in 1840. Um, she was born free. She was in Delaware. And I'm like, well, how is she free in Delaware? Let me look at the history of what was going on there. And I found that there was a community of color. They were called um, a tri-racial community in Delaware. And that's where they were from. And they, they were kind of endogamous, meaning they stayed amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. They married within themselves. Um, it was to protect themselves because slavery was still um, mm -hmm. happening. And it was safer to stay in your community for various reasons. Um, I didn't know anything about that so I, until I started researching the history. And as I got to Googling, I kept seeing my information pop up on freeafricanamericans.com or mitsawakit.com. And I said, well, who are these folks? So I reached out to the people who own those websites. And sometimes mm -hmm. if you want to find that info, just look at the bottom of the site or look mm -hmm. at about us or even a bio, you'll find that info. Most people are so happy to share their information, mm -hmm. to share what they know. They're like, oh, you want to talk about this? Great. And I reached out, hey, you seem to have so many of my folks on your site. What's going on? And they were able to open my um, expand my knowledge about that area, they gave me so much more context about what was going on. They pointed me in the direction of books and resources to help me learn about what was happening and how my folks, this European ancestor, likely ended up plopped in the middle of Delaware, intermarrying with a black family, and then here we are. So what you said mentioned, there were a couple of books of interest that talked about Delaware. What were those books? One was um, Delaware's Forgotten Folk. The name escapes me, but if you go to Millsboro, Delaware, Sussex County, um, and the Nanticoke Indian Museum, they sell that book there. It's very popular. It's very, very helpful because it talks about the Delaware Moors and the folks that lived in those communities. So a lot of people you know, who have knowledge of the area, who are from the area, and historians who've gathered knowledge, they wrote an actual book about the folks in Kent and Sussex County who are of that community. Such a gem, especially if you're from that area. I never would have known it if, um, if I hadn't reached out to some of those folks. And another, they love books. They love books. And uh, one, I have some books here that I had asked Dina if they were of help to her. And this man actually won... Um, all kinds of awards so through the National Genealogical Society, but it's um, Paul Heinig. Yes. And, and he wrote a collection of books on free African-Americans in Maryland and Delaware from the colonial period. Mm -hmm. and then there's like, more, there's more volumes. Yes. And I, those are easily accessible at the Delaware archives. Um, how did you get your hands on those copies? Was it just, I got them like when they first came out. Yeah. So Paul is great because what he did was take a lot of that and he put it right online. Yes. Um, but the books are gems to have because you can access them. You can flip through. They're real good treasures. And you'd be surprised. Oh, I was, I'll speak for myself. You wouldn't be surprised because you know a lot of this stuff. I'm I, always surprised. Yeah. It's always something to learn, right? In genealogy. I was so surprised to know about the tax records and how to find our folks, you know, because we, the history of African-Americans is usually the legacy we're told is, oh, you can't find anything. And whether you were enslaved or whether you were free, first of all, our history matters. And yeah. second of all, um, it's more accessible than we think. We just have to know where to look. And be patient. And be patient, which I have developed a lot of because I didn't <laughs> have it in the beginning. <laughs> this has okay. made me more patient. It helps. It helps. Yeah. So let's move on to step five, which mm -hmm. is to, oops, oh my gosh, that's the wrong step five. Step five is to continue, oh, to analyze your research. 
So talk about analyzing your mitochondrial. So what is it that you do with mitochondrial DNA? Good question. So mitochondrial DNA, you get all this information when you, when you take your test, you find out my haplogroup is H or H1A, F1A. And then you say, now what? So once you start looking at, at what your haplogroup is, where you're from, um, well, what region you're from in, um, in the world, once you realize, you know, H1A is from probably a certain region in maybe Northwestern Europe. And if you're black like me, you say, what does that mean? Um, you start to put that together with the interviews and the research you did with the first three generations. And generally you can start to piece together a story. Um, you can see if you were, um, if your ancestor might have been African, your oldest ancestor, you can say, all right, were they enslaved? Because they might not have been. What, where did they come from? So if they were from Cameroon, look online. Did people from Cameroon come to the state that my ancestors are from? Were they brought to that state? Sometimes people were heavily concentrated in certain areas, Africans were. So um, just analyzing it, putting together the pieces I know the region, I know the family, let me put the history together. That kind of serves as the glue for everything. And once you do that, it can start to tell a story. So that's basically what you did with this ancestor. Your last one is you did a lot, you did research on her. So yeah, yep. And um, she was born, like I said, 1879. When I looked at her parents, 1840, I said, okay, well, wait a minute now. This is before the Civil War. So now I'm seeing they're born 1840. I see them in the 1860 census, the 1850, the 1840. So I'm like, wait a minute, they're free. Let me do some more digging into them. And that's when Paul Heineck's site came in, his books came in. Um, and that's when doors opened. And of course, going down to the Delaware archives, I lived down there. Now, when I make my appointment to go, they just go, hey, and they just, <laughs> they just leave me alone. Because I, you know, it's just it's such a wealth of info. So um, I was able to see baptismal records, census records. And then of course, one feature that Family Tree does, they'll connect you with other people who share your specific haplogroup. So that's a really great way to sink your teeth into that DNA. And just talking to people is a great way to flesh out more information. So, um I know someone who took the family tree DNA test for why this isn't hap did not happen on the mitochondrial side. Mm -hmm. And it's an African-American male. Mm -hmm. There was no one that matched. So, I've been so <laughs> does that happen with mitochondrial? Is that, do you hear that? Is that normal? Not only does it happen, it practically happened to me. I have one of the smallest groups of people who share my mitochondrial DNA. Um, and I've recently come across someone, a group that actually shared my DNA. And it, it's been 10, 15 years in the making that I've, I've found someone. Sometimes you find some folks, but for the most part, I found very, very little. So that poor man, tell him to keep hope alive. He will, his, his people are looking for him just like he's looking for them. <laughs> Um, and if he just, sometimes all you got to do is just go and Google. I, this sounds crazy. Type in the, the whole sequence that he has, whatever for his why, and then type in the, um, the area. You'd be surprised at what you would find out. If That's there's awesome. somebody else out there, then, um, up oh, somebody else, Floyd, cousin Floyd. Yep. So I was wondering if he was going to out himself. Yes. <laughs> he's the one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's all alone. I'm sure he's not. There are other people who share it. Now, if he has gone onto Family Tree, there are projects he can sign up on, um, sign up with people that will share that DNA. Go right on Family Tree, find your DNA, you know, your haplotype for male. And um, there are groups and projects that can connect him, definitely. Men have sometimes an easier time than women because of last names and because um, the way that the genes mutate. So there's hope, cousin Floyd. <laughs> so talk to us more about using the haplogroup, because like like we said, if an African American takes the test and they don't match anyone else, mm -hmm. they don't have a mitochondrial cousin. The yeah. next thing that they should do is to use the haplogroup mm -hmm. and hang out with those guys. Yes, find your folks, find your <laughs> tribe. You know, we're such a mix. We are. Um, 
the way that we came about is is such such an interesting blend, such a mix. So if you don't find people that you know immediately, go online, go to where you took the test, start typing into groups. Hey, does anyone share my Apple group? I did that because nobody shared it. No one African-American nearby except for my biological family. And I came across a fantastic research project that was going on where they had unearthed some um, uh, an old grave in Delaware, Sussex County, Delaware. And I found that the bodies that were there, unfortunately, the remains that were there, fortunately for me, just like we said, you know, dead men too do tell tales, right, Jim? <laughs> so these <laughs> folks told me, wait a minute, we share your DNA. The H1AF is so close to mine that um, it meant that there's definitely a connection. And that, that took it from anywhere in Europe to right there in Sussex County, Delaware. Okay. All because I reached out and touched someone and said, if I can't find you next to me, I'm gonna find you online. So there's hope. I love that. So I wanna share your certificate. Oh, and okay. You can help us know what all the all this stuff on here is. Cause I okay. see upload group, but I also see a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know what they are. So what's all this stuff on here? Like first there's the Haplo group, H1A, and then what are these? The HVR1, HVR2 encoding region. So let's just say this. First, let's go back to the H, uh, H1A, F1A. Most people will get a, um, a haplogroup that will say I'm H, I'm L, I'm X, whichever. Now, if you take a test at 23andMe, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they'll probably break down your mitochondrial group to say your maternal ancestor is you know, blank. So they tend to include mitochondrial DNA when you get your test. But that H1A, F1A, remember I said it goes from H to H1 to H1A, H1A, F1A, and it narrows down. So that shows me that my folks likely came from a place that's now known as, it's called Doggerland, but it was around England, maybe Sweden, Switzerland, somewhere around there. Um, it's, it's from that region. The highest concentration of people that took that test have an ancestor from that Swiss or even Swedish region. Um, let's go down to the HVR1, HVR2. That's when you go from the H to the H1A. So the HBR1 and 2 is when you get a little more narrow. Okay. My test is called full sequence. So it went all the way down to the coding region and got really specific as to where my DNA came from. And all those numbers and letters are just mutations of, um, it, those numbers and letters are assigned to the mutations. And those are mutations that everyone with that DNA will likely share. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So I love that. So Dina, let's look at all the steps. And I want to ask you before we go do look at all the steps. D oh, um, hold on. I think the last step was, oh, continue, uh, continue DNA and documentary research. So when we get back our DNA test, like we're so excited and we're like, this is going to be the answer to everything, <laughs> right? No. And so you get it and you have all these numbers and stuff like what? should you do once you like what are some like kind of basic steps of what you should do once you get it back i have my haplo group i have maybe some people what should i do next i say forget those numbers those numbers are complicated they're if you want to get scientific you can dig into them but what you should do next is uh check out the company that you took your test if it's going to be family tree look at their projects look at people that might share your surname, even though surnames matter more when it comes to the male side, mm -hmm. still look and see those ancestral surnames that you got, those last names when you did your research. Find out mitochondrial projects, who shares those names, who shares that haplogroup. That's gonna be very helpful. And then just start Googling. Find out, even if somebody didn't take an empty DNA test, mm -hmm. if they're from your area, if they're a cousin to your great grandmother, talk to them get them to take a DNA test no. and that, that can confirm, Oh yes. Okay. So we are related through whichever maternal ancestor. So you don't always have to find people who've taken one. You can reach out to people who are just related or, or possibly mm -hmm. related mm -hmm. and then beg and convince them to take a test. <laughs> hint, hint, nudge, nudge. If they are stubborn, 
have a test in your back pocket. So as soon as you mention it and they look interested, pull it out and say, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom yeah. Bruce asks, is GEDmatch any good? GEDmatch is fantastic. Now, GEDmatch is not a DNA testing so place. Talk to but us it's about what GEDmatch is. Okay, GEDmatch is what they call um, an aggregator. So it brings people together who've taken tests from everywhere. Family tree, ancestry, um, African ancestry, anything. What GEDmatch does, when you first upload your DNA results, you're not gonna upload mitochondrial DNA, you'll upload your DNA test, but there's a space when you upload your info, it's gonna ask what your mtDNA is. If you've taken a test, put that mtDNA, type it in the little space on GEDmatch. And then when you start getting your matches, you can see all the people that may share that DNA. And even if it's not exactly like yours, mm -hmm. if it's close to yours, there still is likely a connection. It's not gonna be as close, but it's gonna be a connection nonetheless. So GEDmatch is a really good resource. Yes, I, I love GEDmatch. Me too, because it kind of brings everything together, different people yes. from different uh, companies. Exactly. So let's go through your steps, Dina. I love the mitochondrial. You can think about if there's any last tips you want to share with people. And Dean Henry said hello. So oh, hi. it's your mama's DNA, mastery the mighty mito. Step one, of course, take the DNA test. Step mm -hmm. two, learn about mitochondrial DNA. Dina's going to give us like a couple of places that we could do that. Step mm -hmm. three, research the first three females. Step four, research the history of the area. Step five, analyze DNA test results. And step six, continue DNA and documentary research. So Dina, what's some really cool spaces that you'd like to be in to learn about DNA, stay on top of what's going on with DNA? Well, of course, Roberta Estes, um, Ooh, Roberta. her blog, the one that you just mentioned. DNA she, Explained. Yes, DNA Explained. The title says it all. <laughs> um, she's amazing. Her blog, if you have to check out DNA Explained, she writes in such a user-friendly, down-to-earth way, and she's so funny. Yeah. So she really brings DNA to life. Facebook is a great resource. Mm -hmm. I know they're saying that it's, you know, the Gen Xers are the ones that like Facebook, but it's for everybody. It's, um, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah, it's for everybody because it has so many groups and chats and all these places you can go and just literally in the search, type in mitochondrial DNA, find a group that, that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. And there you can kind of ask your questions, get your questions answered. Um, it's a really great resource. Everybody has access to Facebook. Sign up, check it out. If you want to stay on top of DNA, go to Facebook. All right. Thank you so much, Dina. I hope you guys enjoyed Dina. Let me bring my buddy Jim back. Hello, Hi, Jim. Jim. Hey, Dina. <laughs> hey. We do not have time for a question of the day, but thank you everyone for joining us and an extra special thank you to Dina. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank us you, today. Shamel. All righty, everyone. Toodles. Have a good day. Where's my button at? <laughs>